Hello Crawshaw and welcome to another edition of Remote Learning in Physics. As usual, let's begin with retrieval practice. Number one, what fraction of a radioactive isotope is left after three half lives? Number two, which type, alpha, beta or gamma, is the most ionizing radiation? Number three, what store of energy is found in the reservoir of a hydroelectric dam? And number four, how do we find the volume of a regular object as found in the density practical? Pause while you attempt and play when you're ready for the answers. Looking at those answers, number one, after three half lives, you go from one to a half to a quarter to one eighth. So one eighth of the original isotope would remain. The most ionizing is alpha particles. In a reservoir, the water in the reservoir is high up and will have gravitational potential energy. And finally, we measure the length, the width and the height of the object and multiply them together. Using the equation, volume is length times width times height. Today we're going to look at background radiation and uses of radiation so that we can identify sources and uses. We will describe and evaluate some uses and discuss briefly the idea of risk using data and consequences. So what sources of radiation can you think of? Pause while you have a go. As a definition, background radiation is the radiation which is found in the environment or radiation that is around us all the time. This can be from natural or man-made sources. And there's some statistics there from Public Health England about the average risk, or so the average dose of radiation absorbed per year. Uh, this slide illustrates some of those examples. The vast majority of the, the background radiation comes from rocks. Uh, a type of gas called radon, which is a radioactive. You can see there's some is contamination in food and drink. Some is from isotopes found in the ground and buildings. Uh, and the rest are cosmic rays and other. Uh, a small proportion is from artificial sources. Most of that coming from medical uses, which we'll talk about later in the lesson. A tiny amount from uh, still present in the atmosphere, uh, radiation due to nuclear weapons tests back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and uh, radiation due to nuclear power. So again, the various sources, but you can see a lot of the slides show similar uh, breakdown of what we get. Your background radiation that you receive, that dose of radiation depends on where you live, what kind of job you do. Some jobs are exposed to more radiation than others. And what way does it affect us? Well, most of it is irradiation. OK, so that source is emitting uh, alpha, beta and gamma. A small amount of it is due to contamination by radioisotopes, that is radioactive isotopes in our food and drink. Uh, bananas being a good example, tiny amount of uh, radioactive isotope of potassium found in bananas and you would literally have to eat oh, a million bananas to be at any kind of risk and a million bananas will kill you from other causes far before radiation would. Uh, there's lots of interesting articles on bite size and other places about radon gas. Okay it's not directly mentioned in the speci specification but uh, basically, the gas is given out uh, from deep underground. Okay, certain types of rock have more uh, emission of radon gas. The graph in the picture shows that. Okay, so places like Cornwall, type of rock there, emits a lot of radon gas, and radon gas um, is radioactive. So if you're in a house, you breathe in the gas, you become contaminated with it. The gas is present there and it's constantly irradiating you. Some more definitions for you there. Um, words you might find in articles to do with this. The Becquerel um, is a 
measure of decay. We came across Becquerel's when looking at half-life. And the sievert is the dose of, uh, the, the unit, sorry, of radioactive dose. We tend to measure in millisieverts, that's MSV, the S is capital, uh, rather than sievert because one sievert is actually an incredibly large amount of radiation. Okay, so we talk about millisieverts and indeed microsieverts of radiation. So microsievert being a millionth of a sievert. Um, some side reading on this topic uh, may be found at the comic strip XKCD and that's the link to it there. So this is actually made by a comic artist but based on information he gathered from a range of sources and it gives you a rough idea of where you might get radiation from and how much various things uh, give in terms of dose of radiation. It's not on the exam but it is interesting reading. Please check it out if you get a chance and that's the link uh, on the page there. Uh, I'll just draw your attention to a few of the items on it though. Um, we mentioned bananas earlier there. Eating a single banana has a radio would expose you to a dose of radiation of 0.1 microsievert. So 0.1 of a millionth of a sievert. Very, very small dose. Dental x-ray there is about five microsieverts. And various statistics there. Again, if you look in the present, the actual link, it gives it in much more greater clarity. Uh, different colours on the scale mean different things. This one is talking about actual uh, damage and fatal doses, for example. Uh, so eight sieverts will be enough to kill you, even with treatment. And uh, just as a comparison, if you were to stand next to the Chernobyl reactor core after it melted down and the heat didn't get you, uh, 10 minutes next to that would expose you to 50 sieverts of radiation, which is... Uh, over six times the always lethal dose, just for comparison. Okay, natural radiation is everywhere. Hopefully you have made a list of sources from natural and man-made. Uh, from the specification, uh, we need to know about uses of nuclear radiation. Now the specification specifically mentions uses in medicine for expiration and for control and destruction. So we have to be able to describe and evaluate those uses and look at risks and benefits. So when you're looking at these, please bear in mind what is going to stop alpha, beta or gamma, and therefore that affects the suitability of them for various purposes. In terms of expiration of organs, we use what are called medical tracers. So these are injected into the body or consumed in the form of a drink, depending on where in the body we want to target. And they are absorbed at different rates by different types of tissue. By measuring the amount of radiation given out, we can see where they have got to in the body. And this can tell us various things. It can spot hairline cracks in bone. Uh, it can tell us where certain types of tumor are there because the cancerous cells absorb more radiation, sorry, absorb more of the chemical uh, than other parts of the body and therefore will emit greater amounts of radiation. Okay, so in this example here, we can see low, I believe in this example, it's tumours being shown. So they're going to give out more radiation and will show up on the scan. This is not an x-ray photograph. This is a, a detection device which forms an image. Uh, tracers do not use alpha because alpha radiation is not penetrating it would not get through the skin. So a source inside the body would not. This question asks us about medical tracers. So most of them have a half-life of around six hours. Why would this be desirable? Well, we need the half-life to be long enough that we can uh, have a high activity for detection. So it needs to be in this first kind of part of the curve. Uh, but the half-life must be short enough so that the amount of radiation decreases relatively quickly. Okay, so you see in this example that after two days, there's very little activity that can be attributed to the tracer. 
A long half-life would be something that would persist in the body and would expose you to large amounts of radiation. That would not be good. For control and destruction, we might use something like uh, gamma radiation, and we would uh, fire a beam of gamma radiation at a tumour. We would fire it at it from multiple angles to minimise the damage done to surrounding tissue. So in this example, from three different angles, the tumour will get three doses. The surrounding tissue would only get one dose of radiation and would not be damaged to the same degree. OK, so there's always a trade off between uh, benefit and risk with using radiation. And in this case, you know, the risk of damage to surrounding tissue is outweighed by the benefit of destroying or reducing the size of the tumour being targeted, which would uh, obviously have a negative effect. So we need to evaluate benefits and risks. These kind of questions will often be based on data. Uh, so it might talk about the dose given or the, or the percentage risk of a particular outcome. We need to evaluate them based on that. Um, not specifically given, but on the old specification, we used to talk about things like smoke alarms and um, radiation thickness monitoring. I'm going to show these because they're useful examples. OK, and illustrating various uh, things about radioactivity. So smoke detectors use alpha particles and they release alpha radiation. So this ionizes the air inside the detector, as shown in the left photograph, and that causes an electric current to travel. If something blocks that uh, path, OK, then there's no current uh, because the smoke is absorbing the alpha radiation, which stops the air becoming ionized. When the smoke gets in, there's no current, so the alarm goes off. This can also happen with large amounts of water vapour. OK, so uh, you wouldn't want your smoke alarm too close to the shower because the water particles might have the same effect as smoke particles. Uh, radioactivity is often used to detect leaks. So we can put a small amount of a radioactive material into a pipe and then we would see where radiation not the gas itself, but radiation would come out. If there's a high count rate, that would show us where there's a leak. Similar principle is applied to looking at radioactive tracers for um, after perhaps abdominal surgery. So checking if there are any uh, bad stitching in the intestine. Yeah, so if the radioactive material can leak through the wall, then that would be someone need to be operated on. In thickness monitoring, we use a source and a detector, and the amount of radiation will change depending on how thick the material is. If the material is thin, lots of radiation goes through. If the material is too thick, less radiation goes through, and we can, the detector can adjust the uh, thickness of the material by moving the rollers. For your apply to demonstrate questions, uh, please attempt each one. And we'll look at the answers in a moment. Okay, in this question, you were asked to calculate activity. This is simply a mathematical question. So we're multiplying the uh, amount per kilogram by the mass of the table, the worktop. So we get 225,000 becquerels of activity from that uh, kitchen worktop. This is an example of a question comparing risk, perceived risk. So perceived risk, again, is what you think is the risk to you with what is the actual risk here from this one. Uh, so the householder should not be worried because calculating from this, the yearly dose would be 1.095 millisieverts or 0 0.003 times 365, which is well below 100 millisieverts, which from the table is the lowest dose with evidence of causing cancer in this example. OK, so 
comparing that perceived risk with what is actually transpiring. Uh, question C is a bit of a silly question from some regards, but it's the idea of understanding, making things relatable to the general public. So being able to compare the risk um, from the risk of eating a banana. This again was just a, a proposal at one point. So background radiation is simply that which is due to our environment. We will accept the idea of radiation which is around us all the time. Airline pilots can get a higher dose looking at the table there. They'll be most exposed to cosmic rays than the average. You need to have some idea of comparison in your answer to get the point. So a larger than average dose. Um, the reason for this being that when they're flying, they are higher above the Earth, so there's less air between them and space. So there's less of a shield, less protection offered. Question three, why does the alarm switch on? The smoke absorbs or stops the alpha radiation. So why is it safe to use an alpha? Well, because it is not very penetrating or it does not penetrate skin. We would accept the idea of it not traveling very far through the air. The smoke alarm will not work with beta or gamma because those will penetrate the smoke, they will go through the smoke, and therefore there will be no change in the uh, current rate, there'll be no change in the current. So why should a radiation source in the smoke alarm have a long half-life? Well, we want a long half-life because that will mean an approximately constant value for the count rate. Looking at the graph, um, as long as that graph, if it's above 80 counts per second, the smoke alarm will not be activated. Um, so you know, that's when the radiation level drops and that will happen about 1.3 half lives. Radioactive sources of medical diagnosis need, so for diagnosis, such as for tracers, have certain uh, ideal properties. They should have a short half life, so there's less damage to the body. They should have low ionizing power. So yeah, even if we could use alpha, we wouldn't because of the ionizing. So that less, less damage to your cells. We need something which is highly penetrating, which rules out alpha. We need it to be highly penetrating so that the radiation fr emitting from the source can be detected outside the body. And then again, they've listed about gamma radiation as a prime example of this. So beta and gamma tend to be used for tracers. You would not need all of these points to get the full four marks. This is just a range of things that are, for example, that brings us to the end. Uh, thank you as always for your attention. Please don't forget to check out our other revision channels on Teams, on Century and on Seneca. Thank you and we'll see you next time.